Everybody's heard about the Amazon, about the ongoing clear cutting and rainforest burned down to be replaced by cattle ranches. But there's a lot going on in order to create a more sustainable Amazonia. And this year's laureate has spent decades of research trying to find out how humans here can create a good life with good economic development without destroying the biodiversity of this, the world's largest rainforest. You cannot deal with sustainability in the Amazon if you do not confront the urban reality of the region. The Amazonia actually has this deep history where people from the region have developed many different ways of managing the environment, of producing with the forest without destructing it. Most people know that the world's largest rainforest is in Amazonia, but the region can also be described as an urbanized jungle with over 30 million inhabitants and most of them live in cities. The fast expansion, which is due to migration from surrounding rural areas elsewhere from elsewhere in Brazil, has put a lot of pressure on cities that do not have the resources to provide the sanitation. This is a reality for a lot of urban areas in the Amazon, and we need to remember that 80% of the Amazonian population are living in urban areas, and a good number of them live in conditions precarious at like this. We tend to think of the Amazon as pristine areas of rainforest inhabited only by small groups of indigenous people. But this is a myth. Amazonia has been part of the global history of economic trade and resource trade for over 400 years. And that history is still here. Man has affected nature in Amazonia for centuries. For example, during the massive economic boom from rubber production in the 1800s. The economic growth created large Amazonian cities like Belém and Manaus. Essential crops in the global agricultural economy, such as cacao, cassava and peanuts, also derive from the domestication of rainforest crops. When we talk about the Amazon today, we usually tend to think about the last few decades when deforestation right, and the problems of deforestation came to bear. But there are lots of examples in the Amazon where we see a productive interface between governing territories by the people, and for the people who live there, producing in reconciliation with the forest and the rivers, and generate the resources in a more sustainable way. One such system today is the production of acai, a popular fruit from a palm tree. Acai is in demand not only in Brazil, but is exported worldwide. And it all started here. We are here at the Acai Market in Belém, perhaps one of the most emblematic places in the Amazon. Acai has gained such a momentum because it offers for the Amazon a way forward where food production, economic inclusion and biodiversity conservation can come gain to hand. Acai is often produced locally in communities along the Amazon River using agroforestry. Agroforestry, which is a practice that you find around the globe, is the combination of tree crops, annual crops, and sometimes animal and fishing production as well. Cofruta is a cooperative, a good example of a producer's led cooperative. For 22 years, they have progressively developed a portfolio of fruit pulps, oils, and butters that are extracted from native species or planted species from the Amazonian forest. So it's an effort that tries to bring value aggregation closer to the producers and to be done by the producers. They are bringing tax revenues, they are bringing jobs, and at the same time, they have a major contribution to protecting the environment. For over 30 years, Eduardo Mendicio has documented and analyzed the development and environmental challenges of the Amazon. But his base is as an anthropology professor at Indiana University. The academic who has perhaps most marked Indiana University is Eleanor Ustrom, the first woman to receive the Memorial Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009. 
Eleanor Ostrom challenged the conventional view of the so-called tragedy of the commons. What Eleanor Ostrom and her colleagues did was they showed us that people can be wise stewards, managers of resources in ways that are often more effective than governments or government agencies and even private corporations. An example of how this works in practice is in Amazonia with the largest scaled fish in the world. And it's one of the emblematic fish of the Amazon historically considered one of most important issues. Arapaima was almost depleted by the end of the 1990s. But in 20 years, the implementation of community-based management of fisheries led to the recovery of the Arapaima population. Eduardo Brondizio was one of the co-chairs of the Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. The scientists behind the report called on countries to begin focusing on restoring habitats, growing food on less land and stopping illegal logging and fishing. Today, climate security and biodiversity investments are discussed at the highest levels and the Amazon region plays a key role. I see action everywhere. That doesn't mean that that's the only solution, that there's a panacea there, but it means that there are seeds and there are great foundations upon which to build a more sustainable and inclusive economy that reverts the deforestation equation. I love soccer. <laughs> He loves soccer and football. He really understands the role of creativity. Soccer is a situation where you are an individual, you play your skills, you have your creativity, you have your aims and goals, but you're also part of a team. He is a firm believer in collaborating with people from across the university. He helps people, he likes to help people. He's a really kind person, he's super friendly. I don't think I've ever seen Eduardo angry. Um, I've seen him frustrated. He's a very good baker. He's doing bread, very good bread. I don't know any student he has that doesn't love working with him. He respects, I think, his students as peers. I was born in a city called São José dos Campos. We came from the rural areas and from a small town to a city that was growing fast. And my mom in particular, but also my dad, they would always comment and help us to read that changing landscape. You know, the forest is disappearing and they were always super concerned with the water. Water is a sacred thing that we have to protect. So that interpretation of the landscape, you know, really touched me very deeply. And my mother-in-law also had influence on myself because before I met my wife, I met my mother-in-law uh, as a journalist. Uh, and she wrote this book in the 1980s called The Genocide of the Caissaras. These are the fisher communities along the coast of Sao Paulo in that region. That book made a huge impact on my life and I decided to put my skills to understand the impact of that transformation. Sustainability challenges are about people. What I really most admire is that he's always the one to say, if you're going to tackle a climate problem, you have to have social scientists at the table. I think it helps create a bridge between local and indigenous knowledge systems and global scale problems. Participant observation, learning by living and experience together it gives a very deep perspective. One of the main motivations that I have in doing research is not only the questions that drive me, but the opportunities to work with colleagues, to work collaboratively. This is what I value most in research. But that collaboration has another aspect that has shaped my life and my career, which is to work with one particular collaborator, my wife. <laughs> and also my daughters. So we form a team that's very special. As a scientist, we need to look at the future and see some hope. 
and contribute with information, with knowledge, with discussions, with data that will contribute towards a different future, a more positive future.